Do we have everything? Yeah. So this is it. We're good. I guess we are. It's the 9 to 5, no repeat workday at Long Island's WBAB. Long Island Expressway, Highway 495, 100 miles of road. The vein that connects Manhattan in the west to Montauk in the east. This is the backbone of the island that ties together hundreds of towns. Windanch, Sayaset, Hapog, Patchog, Wanto, Guanconcoma, Quag, Amagansett. Being from Long Island, I have visited these towns and said those names my whole life. Never once have I taken a moment to wonder what they mean. To me, Sayaset was a place to go to the movies. Hapog meant Motor Vehicles Bureau, and Patchog was where my first girlfriend was from. Montauk? Everyone here knows Montauk. It's where the lighthouse is at the end of the island. For me, these were just words, names of places. Growing up, I was taught that these names came from Native American language, but I never thought about it. What does that mean, Native American? To me, Native Americans were Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Geronimo, faded pictures in the history books of social studies class. But Native Americans in Long Island? Where? This is in Montana or Wyoming, a reservation out west. This is Long Island, the epitome of suburbia, a world of malls, shopping centers, and discount stores. Never once while going to school or playing ball on the street did I hang out with a Native American. Nevertheless, been to any reservation. With Ofa behind the camera, we set out on this journey, hoping to find answers to questions that, as Long Islanders, have troubled us for some time. Where are they? What happened to all of them? Who are they? Shinnecock is an Algonquian word, which uh, means uh, the, uh, the level land, uh, the people who live on the level land, this uh, area between uh, the Shinnecock Hills and the, uh, the village of Southampton. This is where the glacier that came down 10,000 years ago, the Wisconsin Glacier, it's where it ended, right here. As the glacier receded, it dropped the, uh, the soil and so forth, which was scraped off from the top of Connecticut and southern New England, uh, here. The first evidence we have of the Shinnecock ancestors uh, goes back to uh, soon after the glacier left, when this became habitable for, uh, for human beings. And the, uh, the peoples that lived here then were essentially hunters and gatherers. Uh, they uh, lived in small bands, uh, probably no more than uh, 50 or 60 people in each uh, group. Really, the, 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 they were extended families. We have reference to the Shinnecock going back to the early Dutch settlers, before, long before the English came here. But in 1640, this was the frontier. This was the West. This was what uh, scholars today call the middle ground, where there was an area where both uh, whites and Native Americans uh, met on equal terms. It wasn't until the whites began to actually expand and tell the uh, Shinnecock that, well, <clears throat> this is our land, you can't plant here, that some tensions emerged. There was a series of negotiations, but we know that a great deal of rum was uh, consumed and the man who uh, ordered the rum was reimbursed for it. It's all a part of the record. The whites were un unabashed about the use of uh, alcohol in this situation. Uh, you have to understand that uh, uh, the 
territory that you're talking about here that was relevant to the, the, the uh, Shinnecock and Montaukett and Korchog included southern New England. So there was a battle, uh, not more than maybe, I don't know, 80 miles as a crow flies at Mystic, Connecticut, uh, which uh, massacred three, four, five hundred uh, Pequot uh, Indians. Obviously, uh, the Chinnacock, Montauk, after seeing this and seeing the, the devastating effect of the firepower that the English had, uh, it's going to impact their relationship. They didn't have to be uh, slaughtered themselves, but their, their neighbors were slaughtered. You only had to destroy uh, a significant segment to make your military impact, your conquest. One of the problems that uh, people uh, face who are uh, suddenly overwhelmed by an alien or outside culture is maintaining their own culture, maintaining their sense of identity and their roots. And in some cases, the whites are uh, uh, opposed to an expression of your own native culture. For example, the powwow, uh, which is uh, actually is an Algonquian word. It comes from the word powwa, uh, P-O-W-W-A. Uh, which means priest, or in the modern uh, term, shaman. Uh, and the powwow is the ceremony that was supervised by the powwow. The, uh, the powwow for the uh, uh, native peoples was a major yearly celebration. Groups would come from all over Long Island, or really probably from the time of the uh, American Revolution. The, uh, uh, the powwow was a, a family get-together done more quietly, and it uh, uh, doesn't emerge as an uh, uh, overt expression, really, until uh, uh, the ceremonial chief, uh, Thunderbird, uh, begins to, uh, to develop this into a larger celebration. It was uh, Chief Thunderbird that uh, encouraged the, uh, the larger participation of outside groups and uh, really began to, to take the leadership role and getting it organized and so forth. Uh, Thunderbird certainly is to be credited with uh, uh, reintroducing and, and helping and, and encouraging this uh, uh, coming forth of the uh, of, uh, traditional culture. Powwow well for me is the coming together of my relatives and friends, of native people, of sharing a culture. Uh, the children learn to dance from one another and watching the elders. And so it is keeping the traditions alive. I've been coming here 20 years and I have participated as a trader and as a dancer. I bring my tradition to other people, and I can share that tradition. You put up, put up the stand. Uh, different traders have different trade items. Some is bone work, uh, some is silver work, uh, pottery. Getting the stand ready to make it look nice for the public. It's a very relaxed atmosphere. We'll get the stand up and. It becomes a family and a friendship that maybe you only see a, a certain person once a year and you're excited about seeing that family. Maybe they live at a very far distance. But it, cer it certainly becomes part of your family or my family after 20 years. The relationships are very strong.
has heard words spoken, many of you have been here before. But to some of you, this is probably your first visit. And you have been welcomed, but I welcome you again. <laughs> It's 2 a.m. The welcoming dinner ended only a few hours ago, and the dawn of a new day is just a few hours ahead. It's been a long and exhausting day, yet we are still not able to let go of the rare moment during the sacred pipe smoking ceremony at the end of the evening that we were asked not to film. Shinnecox and tribal leaders from the different visiting tribes gathered in the center of the community hall, forming a circle. A Shinnecock pipe keeper performed a sacred ritual consisting of the blessing and lighting of tobacco grown for this purpose. Then in a gesture of giving thanks to the Creator and Mother Earth, shared the pipe with the tribal leaders in the circle, for which each one, with their turn, gave thanks. We felt honored and grateful as outsiders for being welcomed as observers for this ancient ritual. This night has a presence all of its own. The mist in the air, the cricket's song, the full moon. As our anticipation for the starting of the powwow overcomes our tiredness and makes us more aware of where we are. At these moments, on this ground, the spirits of the ancestors and times gone by come alive. It's 3.30 in the morning. I don't think we'll be getting any sleep tonight.
I enjoy the powwow. I have been at this powwow since its very beginning. My mother inspired, I think, the Chief Thunderbird to uh, go to the ladies of the church and ask whether or not this uh, continuation of our Shinnecock culture could turn into an affair like this powwow. <laughs> Well, 1963 is my first time coming out here. And if I recall, I was about 12, 11 or 12 years old. And uh, out of the 33 years uh, that I've been present, uh, I've had the opportunity of meeting almost everybody on this reservation, as far as the elders, to the contemporary age groups and myself. Uh, and then two generations past, uh, below me. So it's, uh, for me, this is like coming home. See, most powwows today in the United States are intertribal. And it's the coming together of all tribes for the same purpose, to be together, to share. I, I remember many, many of the old timers that came from Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and uh, uh, to, to, to get to a powwow and hope that they had gas to get here and made enough to get gas to go back. When I dance, it is very special for me to put on my regalia a good feeling. I am a traditional dancer. I may bring part of the past forward into today. I bring my tradition to other people and I can share that tradition. Going into the circle, a lot of dances are, are prayers or have very special meanings. And I feel good at participating to be able to share that. The songs that you sing and the songs that we sing at, the, at these powwows, they all have a different, different purpose. And the songs that are most significant are your healing songs and your ceremonial songs. And some of them songs you guys will never have the opportunity to tape or record, but they're the songs that have carried great significance. Your contemporary powwow songs, again, it unifies people. That, that one beat, the whole purpose of dancing is be able to start with the drum and stop with the drum. The drum is the heartbeat. And the drum is the earth. And I can feel the, the drum in my heart. And it sings the song of the universe, of peace for the universe. And when the drum starts, it is the coming together of all of us as one body. And it's a good feeling, good feeling to share. Singers, drum group, drum roll call will be in 20 minutes, 20 minutes. All dancers, you have one half hour until grand entry, 12 p.m. Thank you, so get ready. 12 o'clock, grand entry. They come from the direction of the four winds, the same as they have for generations, all following the beat of a different drummer. The medicine man, the teacher, the hunter, the trader, the physician, the warrior, man, woman, and child. The power is calling and they must come. What is this force that pulls them all together? It is bigger than the individual. It is the collective thoughts of the past, the present, and the future. It is the hopes, dreams, and anticipations. Though maintaining their own individuality, it is here where all becomes one. One drum, one beat. The grand entry is the summation of all this, the gathering of the people. 
But all dancers, kindly assemble to the rear of the drums, over by the Shinnecock Indian outpost. We're running a mid bit late, but we're going to be on Indian time today. My name is Lance Gums. My native name is Fierce Eyes, and I'm a member of the Shinnecock Nation here where we are sponsoring the 50th annual Labor Day weekend powwow. Young Blood Singers, take it away. Kowankamish is a Algonquin word meaning greetings or or, um, or welcome friends. I am called Kinuk Musitesh. I am Melvin Coombs. I am Mashpee, which is a tribe of the Wampanoag Nation in Massachusetts. <laughs> I am known as Hiawatha Brown. I'm a member of the Tribal Council. My tribe is an Narragansett tribe. My name is Dr. Dale Brooks. I'm from the Seneca tribe. The nation's the Iroquois. Calvin Burns. I'm also known as Wali, which it means in Cherokee, wild eagle. And I'm Shinnecock in Cherokee, and I belong to the Northeastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And I'm part of the Agonigalahi clan, which means long hair. And that's who, that's who I am. Dear, my Mohawk name, I'm Mohawk from uh, Canada, uh, South Shore of Montreal. And my uh, Mohawk name is Awahratu, means hurdle jumper in my language. I'm called T Bear, that's my tribal name. My last name is Wood. I'm Chickahominy Nation in Charles City, Virginia. <laughs> One of the oldest forms of dancing is our traditional style dancing. For instance, a dancer could image the, the wind or the, the weather or animals or a number of things that people depict in, in their own style of dancing. And what you're doing is interpreting a hunt, interpreting uh, um, how you got that particular fish or how you got that particular deer and like you tell it with dance instead of verbally. <laughs> Fancy dance is a contemporary dance. It's, it basically is a dance for show, showmanship. And it's uh, very fancy in its, in its style. And the more, the more colorful regalia you have on, as, as well as a different style of footwork, it's pretty much going to put you on the top. Back in 1988, my father had passed away. And for a short time, I stopped dancing. I lost interest, I lost my heart, you know, because I used to dance on stage with my father, and it was at those moments I really felt that my father was really proud of me, you know, winning competitions, coming in first place, coming home with trophies, big glow on my face to see a glow on his face, and when he died, it was, my best friend died, you know. 
so I lost interest, you know. And recently, about, say, the past five years, I just started back dancing. And the reason why is because I can't let, my father wouldn't want me to do that, you know, and it's, it's true, you know, this is me. This is who I am. This is who I've been since I was two years old. A dancer, a fancy dancer at that. And this is where I felt my father was most proud of me. And even now, I still feel that he's the most proud of me. Right now, he's with me when I dance. And I dance for my father. I dance for him, for my pop, Gray Fox. Present to you, Princess Chi Chi Harry, Shinnecock. Do her interpretation of the Lord's Prayer. And Joe dear, his opening prayer in the language of the Mohawk, Kognawabda. We give gratitude to our Maker that to what He has uh, created for us. The first thing after giving gratitude to our Maker is uh, our Mother Nature, Mother Nature, the Earth, where we dwell and get our substance every day. Grass, medicine, roots of all kinds. There was nothing created that wasn't useful. We give thanks to the sun, our big brother, the warrior. And even so, sometimes in the harsh winter, we don't see him for a couple of days, but he's still pushing his strength to see what you're doing. Now, I'll go into uh, four winds, the uh, north, south, east, and west. All these four winds are always working also. <clears throat> to uh, create fresh air so we can breathe fresh all the time. So now we uh, give gratitude to the moon because she's the one that's supplying the new faces. It depends on uh, what month that she will be born or what month he will be born, female and a male. And that's how they develop their minds and spirit. I thank him again for being able to put the message across my creator and for all my people, all the people, not, not just the red men, for all the people. Thank you. Good afternoon to our friends, to our brother tribes who have come from near and afar to be with us, and to all you beautiful people who have traveled here to be our guests. Again, I say welcome to you on behalf of my Shinnecock people. Have a pleasant day, and thank you. A culture, you see, for, for the scholars, uh, 
is, defi is pretty clearly defined. A culture is a, is a pattern, a series of patterns of behavior. Uh, it's uh, uh, internal relationships in a group and uh, it's a, a, a common heritage. Uh, it doesn't have to be a language. Language is often a part of that, but it also is a, a, a way of relating, for example, to the land, uh, a way of relating to the family. The powwow, for example, is an expression of, of culture in this sense. The uh, kinship groups, uh, they're an expression of culture. <clears throat> you ask any person on Shinnecock about uh, their family, and you're likely going to get a five or ten minute description of uncles, aunts, uh, nephews, grandparents, and so forth. They're all very much aware of this, and this is not something you find in, in outside uh, society so much. The only thing that separates an Indian tribe from any other ethnic group is your tradition and culture and your history. Once you compromise them or once you uh, allow them, them type of histories and cultures to become acculturated, then you're an American. We, hold, we have the benefit of, of holding a dual citizenship. We're citizens of the United States as well as citizens of our nations. So it's a, it's a unique status. However, it's a very complex status, uh, ma mainly because you must be able to walk down a path with a, with a foot, foot in two canoes. You gotta be able to deal with the 20th century values, yet still keep on your culture and traditional values. And for older people, that's, that's a balance. And we've been able to maintain that. But for our, some of our younger, younger people, it's extremely hard for them to maintain that, that balance. I'm proud of my culture. I try to do things positive, I try to live my life right. I give respect to Mother Earth, my sister, the sun, my brother, the moon, and the great spirit every day. Every time I, I wake up, I give them the respect. I eat, sleep, and breathe my culture. I'm not just, see, I'm not just an Indian during powwow season. I'm an Indian 365 days of the year. There's been some tremendous pressures put upon our people uh, from the outside forces. And the forces that we're working against right now is mainly the federal government. You know, they, they have a tendency of classifying people. And when you become classified, then they can determine how they want to deal with you. And certainly that has had a, a negative change on our people. The other pressures that we're facing is the peer pressures that our children are facing in the school systems. You know, there's, there's a certain interpretation of, of histories and what the school systems teach our children has never been the truth. And we teach our children just the opposite as far as the real truths of our traditions within our areas and it seems to create a lot of barriers within the school system and a lot of problems. <laughs> drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth, and um, we believe that once a drum breaks or a drum is disrupted, right, there's trouble. Something's wrong. Something's not right. You could, you could pretty much judge the day by how the drum sounds. drum is off beat, something's wrong. So they try to heat it up with the sun, they try to heat it up with fire, and try to get the beat right.
hear the, how a drum beats, it's boom, 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 right? Just like your heart beating. You know, white man goes, bum, bum, ba -da -bum, bum, bum. If you hear somebody's heart beating like that, take them to the hospital because they're about to die. The more that the, the, the public and, and people are made aware of, of Native Americans in this country, and the more they, I guess, try to understand us, um, maybe the better off we will be. Maybe if we can get them to understand our culture and our way of life, they won't keep coming in trying to get us to assimilate into their society. Maybe we can get them to understand that what we have here, we have no intention of losing. So maybe, you know, we can move them in a direction of understanding. It's the ignorance. It's the ignorance of the people. And, and some people are open-minded and some aren't, you know. They, some people still ask me if I still live in a teepee. You know, and I look at them, I'm like, I don't live in a teepee for one. I lived in a wiki up and a longhouse four fathers ago, you know. Not no more. Now my house is made out of bricks. I hear a lot of people say costume. Well, you know, I go, ooh, you know. They say, no, costume is something that you wear on Halloween or New Year's or something like that, you know. This is our traditional dress. This is our regalia. There's a lot of celebrations, you know, the Independence Day celebration, you know, the Thanksgiving Day celebration, all of these celebrations, but, you know, the, the at this point in time, there is not even a recognized Native American holiday. You know, so when you look at these things and, and you, you put them in perspective, you, you have to just shake your head and you, you say to yourself, somewhere along the line, something went wrong. You know, we have Jewish holidays, we have, you know, Martin Luther King Day. Well, what about a Sitting Bull Day or a Crazy Horse Day or, or, a, or a, a Wine Dance Day or some of the Sachins from Long Island? What about a, a day to recognize the, the native people of this land, the indigenous people of this land? Most importantly, to, to, to keep this tradition strong, we must uh, practice what our forefathers did. And there's very little change and there's very little variance that we have to be able to carry on these, these delicate values. And as an individual, you only can do so much. What makes it strong is when you can muster up a number of people and carry them same words, them same messages forward. That's what's going to keep our, our tribe strong, and that's what's going to keep us alive for, for, for more time to come. Charles K. Smith was a trustee here at the Shinnecock Indian Reservation for over 35 consecutive years. This was his home. This was his life. This was what he was about, the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. I would like to introduce to you at this time my mother, the wife of Charles Smith, his children and his grandchildren. He served his people well for 35 years. He was a man of the earth. He was a traditional man. That's why we ask the traditional dancers to dance in honor of his name. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
are you going to teach your son? Indian way of life. And basically, respect. Respect everything around you, down to a fly, an ant. Respect that ant for what he does because he's trying to feed his people. Respect the grass that grows because that's the grass that feeds you. Respect the leaves that, that give you the shade. Respect his elders. Respect his brothers, his sisters. Most of all, respect our creator and respect who we are. And that's what I'm going to teach him, to be proud of who he is. Don't let anybody ridicule him. He's going to have the long hair going through school. They're going to call him girl. I know they are, right, because I've been called girl. They're going to tease him. And they're going to one little, two little, three little Indian thing. And But I'm going to tell him, don't worry about it. Don't cry. Don't cry. They don't know any better, right? He's got to respect that. He has to go through that part of his life as I went through it. In the last days, we have spent endless hours in the dance arena, being so intimately close to the ceremonies and dancers. We can still feel the drum echoing in our bodies. The drum, the heartbeat of Mother Earth. We were given the opportunity to have a rare glimpse at a culture so rich with life and tradition in an event that represents thousands of years of history. The powwow, the gathering of the people. Lance Gums, Shinnecock. These functions that we're at today, these festivals that we have, these powwows, these social gatherings, these gatherings, like we call them, the gatherings of the people, are what is going to keep us alive, strong, and vibrant in this country. I'm thrilled that so many people came in to join us, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, extremely happy now. My heart has been restarted again. It's, it's pumped up. I'm ready to go another 50 years. Calvin Burns, Cherokee. I'm proud. I'm proud to be here. I'm proud giving this interview, you know, and letting other people know what are we are about. I'm proud to be here with my family, my son, especially my son, and to pay tribute to my creator and to allow me to dance here at this powwow. I am honored to be here. Melvin Coombs, Mashpee. I hope to, through my dancing, to uh, uh, encourage a lot of the younger people to come out there too and want to get their regalia or their traditional dress, you know, together. Dr. Dale Brooks, Seneca. Show us as we really are. Like everyone else, we're human beings, doing our best. We like our culture. We're willing to share our culture. We do not need to take on someone else's culture. T. Bear Wood, Chickahominy. I love dancing. I love the drum. I follow the drum. Wherever the drum is, that's where you'll find me. I'm here now, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And I love it, okay? Just that simple. Harriet Cripp and Gums, Shinnecock. It was very, very inspiring uh, 50 years ago uh, to be at a powwow. Today, you may see thousands and thousands of people come to this powwow. But I remember when there maybe was just a few hundred came to the Shinnecock powwow. Hiawatha Brown, Narragansett. Well, I'm one of the fortunate ones uh, of my generation, and, and there's only a few of us. You know, right now, it's of, the, of the 40 to 50-year-old generation, you know, we're the people that's going to carry the message any way you look at it for the next 30 or 40 years. So it's, it's really important for us to, 
take an interest in, in uh, participate in these type of events. We realize that in the faces of our hosts are the bloodlines of every ethnic group that either fought, built, or suffered to tame this land. And each is proud to call themselves Native American. People that we did not know have invited us in, opened their hearts, and shared their thoughts. Some of the deepest moments that will stay with us long after this power is over are moments when the camera was beside us and the microphone was off. The midnight lessons in beadwork and endless cups of coffee offered to us by Dale and her family. The hospitality and abundance of food given to us by Phil Brown, knowing we were on a tight budget. That instant on the dance arena, in which a dancer handed us a necklace, a piece of his regalia, nodding his head in what felt to be a gesture of acceptance. The power is coming to an end. A circle has been closed. I feel I can speak for Ofra and myself and say that this experience was truly overwhelming. Experience, by definition, is a thought, an emotion, or the accumulation of knowledge by active participation or observation of an event. Our experience started with a thought. What started out as a journey on the Long Island Expressway was only the walk to the starting line. By physically staying in the same place with members of different tribes, we have traveled a much greater distance. So many tribes, so many people, all walking separate roads, yet united on a greater spiritual journey, sharing a common experience of struggle and joy, following in their ancestral paths. We are all traveling the distance.